Mr. Ian Taylor. Number one, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have had various meetings with Ministers today to discuss the implementation of our election pledges. I will have various meetings later, in particular in relation to young people and skills. In addition, I have attended a meeting of the Labour Party's National Executive. I warmly welcome the Prime Minister to his role of answering questions, and I am very grateful to him for finding time in his diary to do so. <laughs> At some point he might consult the House about how these sessions change. I also wish him well in dealing with the massed ranks of his own backbenchers as, as they lose their political virginity. Can the Prime Minister agree today to compensate pensioners for any damage done to pension funds as a result of the windfall tax and changes in advance corporation tax which he might put forward? Well, uh, Madam Speaker, I first of all have to say to the Honourable Gentleman, yes, indeed we have a busy day because this government, unlike the last government, is actually governing in the interests of the people of this country. But secondly, in relation to the windfall tax, if I may just say to him, the windfall tax will not harm pensioners at all. What did, however, harm pensioners was the implementation of the last government putting VAT on fuel. Precisely for that reason, we are proposing cutting it. Um, Jean Corse. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an honour to be called during the first Prime Minister's questions to make a serious attempt to question the Prime Minister in this House. Given that at present only one crime in 50 leads to a conviction, will my right honourable friend recognise the need to have both effective measures to prevent crime as well as a criminal justice system in which the public can have confidence? Will he tell us what measures the government will take to prevent crime? Uh, certainly, Madam Speaker, I will. My honourable friend is absolutely right. Indeed, today the Home Secretary is announcing a series of measures that I hope will have a beneficial effect on cutting crime in this country. He is, of course, announcing, first of all, that in respect of children between the ages of 10 and 13, then we do say they are able to tell the difference between right and wrong and the law should be changed in that respect. Secondly, we are going to half the amount of time it takes to get persistent juvenile offenders to court. And thirdly, he has announced a review of the entire youth justice system. Now, much of the behaviour of some of the young tearaways and thugs in our communities make life hell for people. We are committed to taking action and again, unlike the previous administration, action we will take. Uh, Mr John Swinney. Yeah, 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 yeah. Will the Prime Minister indicate if the government will be arguing for a zonal lifting of the European beef ban? And if that is the case, will he outline a timescale within which we can expect this to be the case? And also, uh, will he give a guarantee that the beef ban will be lifted in Scotland at the same time as it is lifted in Northern Ireland? Yeah, yeah. Well, the Honourable Member will be aware that we are in negotiation now with the European Commission, indeed with our European partners, to try and get the best possible deal on the lifting of the beef ban. And one part of that, of course, is the certified herd scheme. And it is important that we apply that, not in merely in relation to Northern Ireland, where there's the traceability scheme in place at the moment, but important also that we see how we can lift the ban in other parts of the UK as well. I do have to say to the Honourable Members, and, and I say to other members in this House, we have inherited a quite appalling situation in relation to the SE. Not just the expense, but the way that these negotiations were handled, were a disgrace. It will take time to sort it out. But I think that the early indications are that we are able to get a far better deal than the previous government, and we shall do everything we possibly can in the interest, not just of the farming industry, but of the good standing of Britain abroad. Yeah. Uh, Mr Stephen Twigg. Is, is the Prime Minister aware of the widespread public concern about the growth of drug abuse in this country, with a five-fold increase in the number of drug offences over the past decade? Can he outline what the government's plans are to deal with the drugs crisis in this country? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Speaker, certainly. As my honourable friend may know, we are committed to proper testing and treatment for all those offenders that have got a drugs problem. But in addition to that, as we announced before the general election, Madam Speaker, we are going to set up one particular individual, what we call the drug czar, that is going to coordinate all aspects of the fight against drug abuse and the link between drug abuse and crime. It is the fact, Madam Speaker, that in many parts of this country, as much as 50 per cent 
possibly more than 50% of crimes, are linked to drug abuse. It is absolutely essential that we bear down on every single aspect of this problem. And by having one person who is going to be in charge of all aspects of coordinating government policy in relation to this, then responsible to the Home Secretary, we believe that we will give ourselves a far better chance of dealing with this evil in our midst. Mr Paddy Ashdown. Madam Speaker, may I first of all welcome the Prime Minister's attempt to find a new format for Prime Minister's questions. No doubt it was too bold for some, but if the result of that is that we can reach a format for these questions which is a little less confrontational and a little more rational, I think that would have been worth it. Can I ask the... Uh, can I now turn... Can I now... Can I now turn to the government's programme? Is it still the government's intention to spend not a penny more on education in the next two years than the Conservative government they defeated? First of all, if I can say to the right honourable gentleman, I'm delighted for his welcome to the change in the format of question time, which I hope will prove in time for the benefit of all parts of the House. Secondly, I would say to him, in relation to education spending, of course there are differences between ourselves and the previous government in relation to education spending. One difference is the phasing out of the assisted places scheme and the reduction in class sizes for all five, six and seven-year-olds. That is very important. Secondly, of course, the nursery voucher scheme is to be replaced by proper nursery education for our children. Again, right. And, of course, in relation to at least the skills and training part of the education budget, then, of course, the windfall tax will have some impact in helping young people back into work through better skills and training. Uh, Mr Ashdown. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, the, uh, the Prime Minister knows that we believe the figures that they quote on assisted places and its abolition frankly don't add up. But even if they do, even if they do, surely it is the case they are not going to deliver next year and may deliver very little in the year following. So is not the consequence of the government's policy this, that the teachers who were going to be sacked as a result of the Conservative policies are still going to be sacked, that class sizes that were going to rise this autumn are still going to rise? and that the serious situation on books and equipment that are now faced in our schools this winter as a result of Conservative policies will not get better under this Labour government and may indeed even get worse. Um, no, Madam Speaker, I, I don't accept that at all. And I have to say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that, of course, as a result of reducing class sizes, that will in part be done precisely by employing extra teachers. And it is very important. He said that those uh, figures do not add up. Of course, those figures were checked by the National Foundation for Educational Research, which found indeed that the figures did add up, indeed that there was money to spare after that. And I think what is very important to understand is that for the vast majority of people, the parents who use the state education system, they understand it is going to take time to put things right. It will take time because of what we've inherited. But they know now that they have a government with the right values committed to state education system in this country, and we will, over time, improve it in the way that we have promised. Uh, Mr Stuart Bell. Uh, Madam Speaker, having fought the general election on a platform of no hundred days of dynamic action, the definition of dynamic action changing from one Prime Minister to another, and having introduced a Queen's speech with 26 bills, much to the delight of the public, having made the Bank of England independent, having severed the supervision of the Bank of England uh, from banking, having introduced a new regulation for the City of London, can the Prime Minister tell the House what he proposes as an encore? <laughs> Well, I thank my uh, honourable friend for that question. It is, of course, important that we start to make a difference in those areas where the people of this country elected us to make a difference. In our schools, in rebuilding our National Health Service, in giving hope to our young people, and, of course, in the measures that, that my, my honourable friend quite rightly says in relation to the Bank of England. My right honourable friend, the Chancellor, took decisive action right at the very beginning, and I believe he is to be congratulated for that. Yeah. It is far better now that we take the politics out of setting interest rates, that we do not play politics with people's mortgages, and indeed, as the Association of Estate Agents was saying just the other day, in the long term, that will lead to lower mortgage rates and therefore a better deal for homeowners. Yeah. Mr John Major. Yeah. Madam Speaker. In view, in view of the uh, apparent confusion in briefings from ministers over recent days, 
Can the uh, right honourable gentleman please tell the House which companies and which classes of companies are likely to be liable for the windfall tax? And can he also please explain to the House why the chairman of British Telecom apparently felt that his company would not be liable? Uh, well, if I can say to the right honourable gentleman, first of all, I, I mean, I did hear what the chairman of British Telecom uh, said the other day, and I was delighted, of course, that he indicated he had the good judgment to vote Labour in the general election. <laughs> but I have to say, I have to say that, that the, the idea that somehow the chairman of British Telecom, or indeed anyone else, was in any doubt that we were going to introduce a windfall tax, I find rather hard to say. Now, the com actual companies, as the right honourable gentleman knows, we said this many times, will be decided by the Chancellor in accordance with the normal precedent, which is to do any moves in relation to the budget in his budget. Now, that would be the proper way to do it. Yeah. And the, those companies and the amount of the windfall tax will be decided by him in the normal way. Yeah. Mr Major. Mr Sir Ian's vote. He seems to be rather regretting that already, but I will let that pass for the moment. I find it surprising that the House of Commons is to be the last to be told who will be liable to the tax in view of the private briefings that are going on. But perhaps the right honourable gentleman can confirm to the House that no one acting in his capacity or no one from the Labour Party when in opposition gave any indication clearly or uh, in terms of a nod and a wink that British Telecom would not be included in this tax. Can the Prime Minister be categorical about that, please? Yeah, yeah. Madam Speaker, I certainly can be categorical. Everybody has known that the decisions on who is going to be liable for the windfall tax will be taken by my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, in the normal way. And indeed, I may say, British Telecom and everyone else. And indeed, if I may say so, it is perfectly obvious that that should be the case. It would be wholly wrong prior to the budget if my right honourable friend either were to announce the companies or the amounts of the windfall tax. And I have to say this in addition to him, in following that precedent, we are of course following precisely what the last Conservative government did in relation to the windfall tax on banks. Mr Major. The House will note that the right honourable gentleman uh, replied in the generality but did not reply specifically. Yeah. And provide the House and provide the House with the categoric assurance that I ask him for. Perhaps he will do so in just a moment. If this, tax, if this tax proceeds with an extra tax on gas, water, electricity and telephones, may I return to the point made by my honourable friend, the member for Isha and Walton. If that were to give rise to an increase in the bills for many people on low, income, uh, low incomes in this country, Will the right honourable gentleman follow the precedent of the previous government and increase the social security benefits to compensate for that? And if not, if not, will he accept that the populist tax he proposes on fat cats would in fact be a tax that hits most those that have least? Uh, no, Madam Speaker. No. No. No, I shall resist the temptation to say that was the sound bite since I know. <laughs> Since, since, I, since I have a feeling I used to use a few of those myself at one time. Uh, uh, Madam Speaker, no, that is not the case at all. In fact, there is a cap, of course, on prices. Indeed, some of the regulators have already said that they would not consider it right for the windfall tax to lead to any increase in prices. I may also say this to the right honourable gentleman. The reason for introducing the windfall tax is clear. There is no doubt at all that excess profits, vast excess profits, were made. There is no doubt of that. There is no doubt also that it is absolutely essential that we give hope and opportunity to those hundreds of thousands of young people presently without it in our society today. And I think there will be a great deal of agreement, not just amongst those that don't have opportunity, but even amongst those that are perfectly well off in our society at the moment, that if we don't tackle the problems of a growing underclass of people cut off from society's mainstream without any chance of a job with poor educational opportunity, without the chance to do well in life, then we will end up, as the previous government did, paying more and more by way of welfare bills and having less and less for future investment. Mr Jerry Birmingham. Madam Speaker, could I ask my right honourable... Uh, friend, just a simple plea on behalf of St Helens, which is an industrial town. Perhaps he could find time to have a word in the ear of the, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and suggest to him that the June budget, if slanted towards encouraging investment in industry, 
and will undoubtedly help both our manufacturing base, both for home consumption and overseas export, and thus the welfare of our, all our people. Well, I thank my honourable friend for that. I've got no doubt at all that the Chancellor will be receiving a great deal of advice and assistance in uh, the weeks ahead. And, of course, he will have listened carefully to what my honourable friend said, and I've no doubt will take it into account. Mr Peter Luff. Madam Speaker, how will the Prime Minister fund his programme for young people when the money from the windfall tax dries up? Because all the experts agree it will, and he will need extra money. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Speaker, first of, all, first of all, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I'm absolutely delighted that he seems to understand, as his leader did not, that money is needed to tackle this problem. And I agree with him wholeheartedly about that. Yes, the, one -off, the, the windfall levy is a one-off. But, of course, by getting young people off benefit and into work, that is precisely what saves us the money in the long term. Well, I have to say that the Honourable Member and other Honourable Members shake their head. There is absolutely no doubt at all that there are young people in this country who are leaving school without any proper qualifications at all. If they don't get the right chances on skills and apprenticeships, they'll never make anything of their lives. And I can tell them this. I have met, in the course of this election campaign, some third-generation families where the father hasn't worked, the son hasn't worked, the son isn't going to be working either. Now, unless we try to give them some sort of chance to escape from that welfare dependency, we will be in this difficulty forever. Uh, Lord Fitzsimmons. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, um, comment on the problems uh, that our communities face, not just because of the causes of crime, but also because of the underlying aggressive and loudest behaviour in some of our communities? And what is the government going to do about this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Madam Speaker, of course, my honourable friend is absolutely right. And that is one of the reasons why the measures that we announced in the Queen's speech aren't merely measures that tackle juvenile offending, indeed other criminal offences too. They're also measures that tackle disruptive or noisy or antisocial neighbours. And I think that all of us who have talked to our constituents in this House will know the misery that is caused by small groups of people that act in an antisocial way. And this government, at long last, is going to do something about it. Mr David Curry. Does the government intend to limit the amount of time British fishermen can spend at sea in order to meet cuts in European quotas, as suggested by his fisheries minister? Uh, no, Madam Speaker, actually what we have tried to secure, if I may say so, and we're trying to secure it against the background, as I say, where the negotiations have not been well handled by the previous administration. We will try and secure the very best deal for our fishermen on quota hopping and on other issues so that we can put in place a long-term framework that actually guarantees their future and offers some stability. Eric Ilsley. Is my right honourable friend aware that there are some, an estimated 120 million anti-personnel landmines planted around the world? Landmines which kill or maim someone every 20 minutes, in many cases young children, innocent children. When does my right honourable friend expect to be able to act to fulfil Labour's commitment to ban these evil weapons for good? Yeah. Uh, Madam Speaker, I can tell my honourable friend uh, that the government will be announcing later today that we will ban the import, export, transfer and manufacture of anti-personnel yeah. yeah. We will also phase out the UK stocks of such anti-personnel landmines. We will, in addition, make sure that we ban the trade through the United Kingdom of all such landmines. They have done enormous carnage, often to wholly innocent civilians, including children. And the sooner that Britain gives a lead in this, the better. It is the right and the civilised thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Robert Jackson. Will the right honourable gentleman undertake a review of the somewhat curious arrangements that he, that he has inherited for science policy? Will he consider two points in particular? First, whether it is right to have the government's chief scientific adviser located not in the centre of government but in one of the departments for which he is responsible for supervising, and second, whether it is sensible to have two different ministers responsible for the research councils and the universities when research council funding is integral to the funding of the universities. Well, Madam Speaker, first of all, can I thank the uh, honourable gentleman for his question and also for the, the notice that he gave me of it. And can I uh, pay tribute to the amount of work that he did when a minister in the previous government, both in education and the science field, 
Uh, the review that is being conducted by my honourable friend, the Minister of State, will look at both the points that the honourable gentleman raises. I give no undertakings at all as to the outcome of that review, but yes, it will certainly look at those things too. Mr David Winnick. As far as Northern Ireland is concerned, would my right honourable friend confirm that the framework document remains on the table and that would provide a fair settlement for both communities in Northern Ireland, including cross-border bodies. And would not the Prime Minister not also agree that there's a particular responsibility on the part of the IRA to end their murderous and terrorist campaign, which has caused only pain and suffering and numerous deaths during the last 25 years? And is it not obvious that no amount of such terrorist activities will in any way change the position in Northern Ireland? Uh, I agree very much with what my honourable friend has said about the activities of the IRA, uh, Madam Speaker. If I can just say to him that, of course, all the documents that were negotiated by the previous government remain on the table. In relation to Sinn Féin, as my honourable friend knows, uh, my officials are talking to Sinn Féin, but I do say this, and I think this should be made very, very clear to them, that there is no question of Sinn Féin participating in any talks whatever unless there is a clear, credible and unequivocal ceasefire and that should be demonstrated in word and deed and they and everybody else should be under no illusions about that whatever. Mr David Trimble. Uh, thank you Madam Speaker. Uh, I would endorse what the Prime Minister has just said about the terms of entry for Sinn Féin into talks and I'm sure that he will ensure that in any discussions that officials may be having that that will be borne home to Sinn Féin and that he will ensure that those, uh, that discussion does not move into negotiation, which of course would not be permissible. But I'm sure the Prime Minister is bearing in mind the fact that there is an election taking place in Northern Ireland today. Does he think, there, in the light of that and in light of the comments which he has commended made by the Irish Prime Minister and by the Honourable Member for Foyle, that a vote for Sinn Féin is a vote for murder, does he think it was wise for officials in the Home Office and the Northern Ireland Office to arrange for events to take place today which would only boost the standing of Sinn Féin. Well, uh, Madam Speaker, I understand rightly the events he's referring to are the transfer of the, the, the prisoners. Perhaps I can just come to that in a moment. But I can say to him in relation to the talks with uh, Sinn Féin, there is no question of that being about a negotiation of a ceasefire. It is to make clear the government's terms and conditions for their entry into any such talks. Secondly, in relation to the prisoners that have been transferred, the two prisoners, I have made inquiries about this, and it is clear that that was something put in train actually before the general election. It is something that follows on, I think there were some nine such prisoners transferred who were convicted of terrorist offences in the last year, but it should not be seen in any way as any signal to Sinn Féin at all. Mr Colin Victor. Number seven, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, we are doing everything we possibly can to alleviate poverty amongst Britain's pensioners. Uh, there are many hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of Britain's pensioners who enjoy um, a good standard of living. There are many more who do not. And that is one reason why we are looking urgently at the help that can be given to Britain's poorest pensioners. And, of course, it is one reason why we are committed to the cut in VAT on fuel. Mr Pickhall. Would my right honourable friend agree that one of the uh, problems of pensioner poverty is caused by the complexities and sometimes by the arbitrary nature of the income support cut-off points? Would he find time, unlike the previous government who refused, to look at the work done by uh, Lancashire County Council's Welfare Rights Service, who have managed to find ingenious means of getting 15% more pensioners claiming uh, income support, about 7,000 individuals, totalling about £4 million going into pensioners' pockets in Lancashire? And would he use his immense influence to ensure that the uh, government's programme for ending pensioner poverty begins by getting pensioners the rights and the benefits to which they're entitled. Yeah. Well, I should say to my honourable friend that I'm very happy to congratulate the work of those that are bringing home to pensioners the entitlements that they have. I would say two other things to him as well, that of course uh, the review of pensions that's been undertaken by the Department of Social Security will include how we help those pensioners in greatest poverty. And in addition to that, I hope that 
he can say to his constituents, as I would say to the country, that previous Labour governments have done well by Britain's pensioners, always, and we will do well by them again. And, well, we have, we've done well, we have done very well, as indeed they know, and though no doubt there will be different ways of doing well for a different age, we shall continue to do our best by Britain's pensioners. Mr James Wallace. Madam Speaker, if, as the Prime Minister indicated some moments ago, a lifting of the beef export ban isn't exactly imminent, is he able to indicate what kind of approximate timescale our beef producers might reasonably expect? And in the meantime, what steps is his government taking to restrict imports into the United Kingdom of beef products which don't meet the same very high standards of our domestic producers? Well, Madam Speaker, we obviously want to do everything we possibly can to encourage and bring about the lifting of the beef ban. And I say to the Honourable Gentleman, with the greatest respect, I don't think plucking out arbitrary timetables is a very good history in this matter. Uh, we remember what happened before. However, I do actually believe... I, I don't, I'm sorry to bring back bad memories, but, uh, 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 but I do have to say to him... I do have to say to them that I believe that we can make progress, and I am hopeful that progress is being made, and I think the very fact that we have a government that is arguing the case sensibly and constructively gives us a far better chance than the previous administration. Mr Gordon Prentice. Yes. Does the Prime Minister appreciate the feelings of indignation and outrage amongst bus passengers in North East Lancashire who have been left high and dry by stagecoach? and that even as I speak, bus fares are going up, services are being cut, drivers are leaving in droves, and the situation is in crisis. And is it not a shaming indictment of the policies of the previous government that we left with this situation, where private monopolies have driven out the public interest? Yeah. Well, um, in the interest of uh, non-confrontational uh, exchanges across this dispatch box, shaming indictment, well, we will leave that to others to judge. But I have to say to them, the one thing that I think is quite clear is that there are severe problems with the regulatory system that exists at the moment. That is why uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, in addition to his, uh, his rain-making duties, is also, undertaking, <laughs> is also undertaking a review of bus regulation. And we are well aware of the need to make sure particularly for people in rural communities, that they get the bus services that they need. Yeah. Mr James Gray. Yeah, yeah. Uh, will the Prime Minister find time to visit those employers in my constituents of North Wiltshire who tell me that they will lay off workers the morning after he brings in the minimum wage? <laughs> um, and, and, would he not, and would he not agree... Uh, would he not agree that the tragically high level of youth unemployment in the continent of Europe is not least because of the job-destroying minimum wage in Europe? Yeah. Well, I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman, first of all, that the United States, for example, has a minimum wage and has a lower unemployment rate than here. And I think that, in contradistinction to the position here, that is a matter now of agreement between the Republican Party and the Democrats. It's a pity we can't get the same agreement about decency here. I say also to him, in respect of the minimum wage, that employers will, of course, be fully consulted about the level at which it's set and how it is implemented. That is very important. But I really do not believe that the conservative way of competing on the basis of low wages and low skills is the right future for Britain. The way that we will compete in the future is by investing in our people and by employers recognising that if you treat people fairly, you get the best out of them. And if that is one change that an incoming Labour government can bring about, we will have done a service to the whole country. Maria Fife. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Has my right honourable friend noticed that in this first session of Prime Minister's questions, we have already got through more questions than we would have done in two quarter hour sessions. Yeah, it has been a more civilised and informative event than ever before, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we look forward to this in the future. And on the question of a national minimum wage, many of us take great pride in the fact that the Labour Party stuck through thick and thin to this policy and intends to implement it as early as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for those comments, and I. I hope that people will understand that it is a better way of organising Prime Minister's questions. Of course it is the case that the Select Committee on Procedure that my right honourable friend is establishing will look at ways that this can be improved in the light of the experience that we have. And on the minimum wage, I would simply, again, not to repeat what I've just said now, 
There are some 800,000 people in this country paid £2.50 an hour or less. I think there are reasons of efficiency for introducing some basic minimum threshold of pay, but I also think there are reasons of decency and fairness too, and we shall do it. Thank you. Time's up.